I want to thank Chris for finishing his talk so early that I could use that as a guide for my talk. And, and Firas also provided me with, with some slides, but you know, Chris was, was really on the ball with this. Um, so to reiterate what Chris said, thanks, thanks Chris, is, is that none of the, the procedures and workflows I'm gonna talk about are meant to be the definitive. So again, like, like what Chris talked about, like what Firas had talked about, what all the physicists are gonna talk about is, you know, you know, how do you commission your HDR program? Well, you know, like, you know, you get a review of the literature, there's equipment QA, there's staff training, there's end-to-end -end testing and dry runs. Um, so a lot of the published guidelines are similar to uh, um, what's out there for, for LDR, you know, the brachytherapy guidelines tend to reinforce each other. I recommend that everyone go to the ABS website and because for whatever, you know, not just for prostate brachytherapy, LDR or HDR, um, for any kind of brachytherapy you're gonna do, the ABS has consensus guidelines. It's very useful um, for everyone to, to take advantage of that resource. In terms of equipment QA, um, you know, there's, there's what Chris talked about, treatment planning system, commissioning, and QA. Um, there is your daily quality assurance of your HDR equipment. And, and for prostate, it really isn't gonna be any different from your normal HDR treatment QA. Um, there's ultrasound QA, TG128. Oh, here we go, this is something new, needle QA. Um, if you're using reusable needles, check them out. Are they bent? Are they dull? If they're reusable, how many times have they been used? Um, in the instructions for use for the needles, it's gonna tell you how many times you can use them. Um, in terms of commissioning, there's, there's non-dosimetric tasks and dosimetric tasks. So again, Firas provided this, this uh, slide to both, both Chris and, and myself, is there's imaging QA, there's uh, contouring quality assurance, um, you know, there, there's applicator registration and source registration accuracy, and then there's the assumptions of the, doors, of the dose model. So in terms of non-dosimetric tests, um, you know, you need to get your images into your planning system. So are they correctly brought into your planning system? Um, is your contouring cor correct? Can you transfer the plan accurately to your treatment console? Oh, here's an important one, computer storage and, and database backup. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, so uh, Firas provided this slide. So if you look in terms of just getting your images into your, uh, into your treatment planning system, is the DICOM information accurate? Is the, is the image orientation correct between left and right? We know, especially from uh, using MR, you know, there's very common cases with gamma knife of right and left switching and so the wrong side of the brain gets treated. So we wanna make sure that all the images get transferred properly. Um, contouring, this is something we don't really think about that much as you know, you know, physicists aren't doing a lot of contouring. You know, a lot of times the, you know, you have dosimetrist contouring, you have the, the physician's contouring. But, you know, if you can import a mathematical phantom um, with a known volume into your planning system, and then you contour, okay? So then, you know, you can check, is your volume correct? And this is actually a, a one of the tests in TG-128. The TG-128 Phantom actually has uh, volume, you know, imp uh, inserts of known volume, and you transfer that and contour it. You can contour it either on your ultrasound or in your planning system. Check the accuracy of your contouring. One of the things I will say is, to a certain extent, 
you're testing the skill of the contour. Okay, it's not that the contour is wrong, it's just, you know, there's a certain skill in contouring these. Um, if you're going to use auto contouring, well, this, you know, as we move, move more and more towards auto planning, maybe we can move towards auto contouring and we can check the auto contouring algorithm based on the known volume of, of the, the uh, regions. Um, and again, it's a reasonableness test. You know, display your contours in different ways. Does everything look reasonable? Um, in terms of dosimetric tests, uh, TG43, which, which um, you know, Chris spoke about. Um, you know, there, there's also you know, displaying of the dose, DBH tests, source localization tools, uh, impact of the grid size. You know, find, you know, you might have some inaccuracies in your testing based on, on the voxel size of your, um, of, of your grid. You know, important, like what Chris said, like what, what Fira said, what physicists all over the world say, document, 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 document. So we have a network uh, drive, network folder that's backed up um, by the university um, where we put all of our treatment planning system documentation. So, you know, we have a copy of the document. You know, what are the tests we're going to do? We have a copy of the plans. We have a copy of all the results. So if you just, you know, you know just in, as an example for VTest, the product from Varian, is that we, you know, have this document. We say we did it in accordance with the procedure. The procedures and the network drive. Everyone can look up what the procedure is. Um, do we have a mouse? Oh. Hmm. Okay. So yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, it's the. Oh, it's on that. Okay. Zoomed in now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, it might be hard to see this, but you know, Varian provides you know the tests you should do, what the dose at different dose points should be, and then what the planning system, what your test gives, and so you can see, you know, we're within the maximum differences. There is 1.5 percent. Um, there's other tests from uh, in the document. Um, you know, dose points at various angles uh, from your source. You get, um, you know, dose volume tests where you put a source at a certain position and what is the volume of a certain isodose line. So all of these are in your procedure. Do it, document it. Um, you know, this is a slide from Firas. Is not only do you have the test of your treatment planning system, does it calculate it right, but we need some kind of independent calculation. So in this case, um, there's two sources. You can see there, there's various dose points where you determine what the uh, dose at those points are, and then you're checking to make sure that your treatment planning system and your second check software agree with each other. So in terms of other QA, um, and, I, and I think you know, it's basically a lot of the other QA that we do is similar to that for, for seed implants uh, or for other HDR procedures. So since Chris had pro tips, I'm gonna show some pro tips. Uh, TG128 pro tip, instead of trying to, you know, duct tape your phantom to the couch, stick it in a bucket of water. Um, we, you know, we, it makes it much easier. Uh, the phantom's not moving around. Rather than trying to get the gel to apply properly to the phantom, you, you know, the water, um, just applies that contact. It makes uh, TG128 much simpler. Um, in terms of needle usage pro tip, when we put our plan into the treatment planning system for that day, um, we have our different sets of needles. So in this way, we can keep track of how often we're using our sets of needles, and we know when we're starting to get close 
to the limits of the number of uses, it's time to order more needles. Um, in terms of staff training, that's a big staff for prostate HDR. Um, you have the radiation oncologist, uh, a lot of you will have urologists, there's urologists here, anesthesia, one of the things you know, we talk about uh, with our anesthesia team is the patient can't move. Um, so you have a circulating nurse, physicist, then you have lots of other people. You have second physicist, a dosimetrist, physics resident, radiation therapist, medical residents, maybe if you're lucky an ultrasound tech. We don't have an ultrasound tech. But just a lot of staff in there. So there's a lot of choreography that goes on among these various staff members. Um, you, know, you will have an OR preparation, and one of the things I, I, I talk about with my physics colleagues is it's kind of your job to know what everyone else is doing. And uh, a tip for physicists, because a lot of times physicists don't spend a lot of time in the, in the OR. If it's in blue, it's sterile, stay away. Um, you know, you know and, and so, but you know, a lot of us have our, our name badges on, on lanyards as opposed to clips, and you lean over that sterile table and your badge can get awful close to that table. Um, you know, and, and we also have all the physics equipment set up for our OR. We have our, our afterloader, our ultrasound, our stepper, our treatment planning system. Just, you know, it, it looks like you've got a big procedure room, and then when you start putting all that equipment in there, you have to keep track of where everything is. Um, you know, like, like what we all talk about is do a dry run. So just, you know, this will help you figure out where the inefficiencies are. So, you know, you, you have your prostate phantom, you have your, a track stepper, you, your treatment planning system, your, your ultrasound, you got to make sure, you know, take the time to make sure you know how it gets set up every time, get to the procedure room or wherever you're doing it in plenty of time to set things up. Just little things, you know, if something's not working right, you give yourself time before they get the patient in the room to make sure everything's working properly. Um, in terms of imaging modalities that we're dealing with, um, there's CT, so if you look on the top, that's what titanium needles look like as opposed to plastic needles on the bottom. Uh, ultrasound, which you're gonna see a lot of uh, over the next couple days, and then uh, increasingly more MR, incorporation of MR into your workflow. On the top is just doing a plan from the T2 MR, whereas on the bottom is a fusion between your ultrasound and your MR where the dill is contoured in red, so you want to make sure that that gets covered very well. Um, you know, in terms of clinical workflow, you know, there's, there's the workflow for ultrasound-based planning. Um, the workflow would be a little bit different for CT-based planning. And I'll, I'll say MR, I'll just put the MR-based planning in parentheses. You know, it's starting to become more common, but the workflow is very similar to CT-based planning. So this is kind of our workflow at University of Virginia. Uh, once we get the patient in the room, uh, prepped, uh, ultrasound taken, you know, we capture the ultrasound. Uh, we have a urologist placing needles while the rat on contours. Um, uh, and then we'll adjust and, and capture the needle locations. Um, you know, then we'll do a recapture of the ultrasound because once you start jabbing needles, into your prostate, you get edema, the prostate moves, uh, we plan the planet, we do our treatment QA, we treat, and we remove the needles. So that process, we have that process down to somewhere 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, we get a lot of visitors coming to us, and they always go back to their institutions, and they, they say, you know, it's taken us three and a half, four hours to do it. And what I always say is, yeah, that's kind of what it took when we first started doing it. And, and now that we've done 150 or so cases, you know, we, as I said earlier, we've worked out the choreography, we've worked out who's doing what, when, and you know, we threw some manpower, you know, duplication of efforts, and this way we can get, us, get it down to a reasonable time, not to have you know, the 45 minutes of 
OR time that some places do for seed implants, but certainly a reasonable amount of time. I suppose, so if you look at ultrasound-based planning for HDR, um, you just have to understand you know, the geom geometric accuracy of the images. Um, we do have a track stepper, so you have to uh, validate that. And you know, the, probably the hardest part that we're dealing with all the time is needle tip identification. Um, as you're, you know, once you've got 20 needles in a prostate, you get all these echoes going all over the place from the ultrasound. Um, so sometimes it can be hard to identify the needle tips especially. Um, for CT workflow, it's a much longer process. So typically, you know, the needles are placed in an OR, and then you move the patient to recovery. They, then they finally come to your department. You get a CT. You have to get them up on the CT table. You've moved the patient again. Um, you have to look at your needle locations. You adjust. It might be a few iterations of adjusting the needles uh, while you're planning the treatment. Um, you have to move the patient again off your CT scanner. Um, you do your planning QA, and then you move the patient to, to wherever you're going to treat them. Uh, if you have a dedicated suite or if, if you're after loaders in, in a LINAC vault, um, you have to uh, image the patient again to make sure the needles haven't shifted. So you might have a few iterations of the adjustment again, and then you get your treatment and needle removal. So, and this can take many hours. Um, so one of the things you can think about when, you know, what's the effect of time on your treatment process? Okay, so on the, on the left you have your, your needles going through the template into the prostate and this is what it looked like at the time of placement. So the next time you image the patient, the prostate might have shifted, you know, the needle stayed in the same position but your prostate shifted suit. So now your needles are not in the optimal place. You know, another thing that can occur is that you know, the prostate and template stay in the same position, but your needle shifted. So now you've got to shove the needles back in. Or you know, something else that can happen is your prostate stayed in the same position, but your template shifted out, taking the needles with it. So all of these things are, are, are items you have to consider once you start moving patients around. Um, and so you can see here, um, you, know, you have to develop procedures to minimize and detect um, needle, needle displacement. You know, one of the things you know, vendors provide is methods to move the patient while their legs are still up in the lithotomy position. You, know, you can image, you know, you're trying to minimize um, anything that can happen that would cause the needles to move. Uh, MR-based planning, you know, we're, we're not used to uh, um, MR as much in radiation oncology as opposed, you know, especially with physicists, you know, therapy physicists as opposed to diagnostic physicists. Um, we have to understand image distortions. Obviously, you know, you have to deal with patient transport just like with CT-based planning. And you know, at the times of the implant is you know, you're dealing with space restrictions. So needle placement pro tip, um, and this is something you, know, you can discuss uh, with, with your radiation oncologist, is if you insert your needle by one cm beyond the base, uh, that will help ensure good dosimetric coverage of the base. So the needle itself you know, ha has a has dead space at the tip caused, caused by the point of the needle, and then like you know, your variant afterloader, it shoots the source out, there's a little bit of overshoot. When it goes out, it pulls it back, so you need a little bit more dead space. So if you over-insert the needles beyond the base, you can ensure good coverage of the base. Uh, another needle placement pro tip is that uh, if you place the needles all to the same depth, then the exposed length is the same. And so one of the things we do is measure that exposed length and put that into our plan. If it's the same for all needles, okay, that makes that measurement much easier. You're not trying to measure the exposed length of all the needles. It also makes it easier to see things on the ultrasound. You know, if you're having trouble um, you know, seeing the tip of the needle on ultrasound, you know that 
you know, if the exposed length is the same, it's at the right position. Um, you know, HDR pro tip as opposed to an LDR pro tip is your needles don't have to align perfectly with the template grid. Um, you can use optimization to make up for an imperfect implant. Obviously, if you run into a lot of pubic arch interference, there's going to be areas that'll be difficult to cover. Um, but let the optimization solve that problem for you. So you can see that's one of our cases on the left. And you can, you know, it, it might be a little bit hard to see, but there's little green lines where it show where I dragged the needle uh, from its spot on the template grid to where it was on the ultrasound. Um, you know, and similar to what Chris said uh, about, you know, tracking your, your implant is develop a sanity check procedure. So uh, we, you know, had a, a physics resident develop this. He looked at our Curie seconds, activity times time, for our first 90 prostate HDRs and developed this nomogram and, and we have this little Excel uh, program that runs and we put the prostate volume in and it spits out what the Curie second should be and we look at that in our plan. So if, if our Curie seconds for our plan, current plan differs greatly from our past experience, we're like, okay, what's wrong here? You know, what is different for this case? Does the plan make sense? Um, one of the things, you know, treatment misadventures, you know, the, the, your regulators or the, uh, or the state, you know, will, will, you know, call them medical events. Um, and this is not for a prostate, but, you know, if you look here, this was reported to the NRC, is that the measurement length of your catheters was incorrect, put into the planning system incorrectly. And our RSO actually sends us out um, medical events reported to the NRC just, you know, just for us to keep track of. This is a very common error, having your treatment lengths incorrect uh, in your planning system that gets sent to your treatment console. Um, so one of the things we have is we have our SIM sheet. This is not just for our prostates. We'd use it for our sciads and, and other implants as well. And our policy is we measure every length for every case. It takes time, um, but this is, you know, helps us make sure that we don't have that. And there's a published report in brachytherapy from a few years ago saying, you know, what are the most common uh, brachytherapy errors? If you look at, you know, the second one there, catheter length measurement system, okay? It's one of those things we reiterate, there's a common error. Um, so to conclude, you know, you want to make your program work within your clinical workflow, okay? But, here's the but, is you need to adapt your clinical workflow to improve the efficiency and the quality of your program. So thank you very much.